Good afternoon. Um, I'm Hannah, and I would like to start this by saying thank you to all the open source um, contributors and our programmers, because without them, I would have never, ever done mapping. Um, so about me, I, um, I would like to see myself as a full-time journalist, a part-time mermaid, but I'm not working, and a QGIS sorceress in training. Um, but for today, the hat that I'm using is the QGIS sorceress in training. And you might ask why sorceress of all things? Um, I heard of QGIS when I was at the Financial Times. I was the web editor, I think that was seven years ago. And the first time they showed me how to do a map using shapefiles and KMLs and all these things I never understood, the first thing that popped into my mind was, what sorcery is this? It's like, I am a journalist. I have a journalism background from uni. I can write, I can produce, I can take photos, but maps is something very foreign to me. So before doing maps and visualizations, oh, um, how do I, sorry. I did not, so this is what I did before. Um, I can't get out of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it opened a window. Okay. So this is what I did before. I did beat reporting. I would go out, cover stories, um, would be behind the camera, write the script. This was a totally different world for me. Um, but how did I learn it? I was the web editor, and at some point we were asked, who wants to learn graphics? It was just a random question thrown in the newsroom. And being the youngest editor in the newsroom, I was scared that if I did not expand my skills, I'll be the first one out, in case they want people out. <laughs> so I raised my hand, not knowing what, is it, what I was getting myself into. Um, and my mentors were in London. I was on Manila, in Manila, on Manila time. Um, and I have no idea how I survived that training, but they started sending me links. This is how you learn Illustrator. This is how you learn mapping. And they just threw the name out there. It's like, we're gonna use QGIS. And what did my mentor send me? He sent me YouTube links. Um, <laughs> This is my mentor in London. His name is Stephen Bernard. He has a gallery, a playlist of um, QGIS tutorials. So basically, for Manila, this is what I watched. Hi there, and welcome to the first in this series of tutorials. Yeah, so I, I can send around the link, but basically that's it. So I would sit in the newsroom, put my earphones on, and look at the YouTube videos and follow what he's trying to tell me. Um, I did that for, let's say, six months before I finally was able to sit down with someone in London who can show me how it's done. Um, it's a little scary, especially if you're coming in without any GIS knowledge. When they would tell me, um, can you give me the coordinates? What the hell are coordinates? <laughs> I'm sorry, it was the scariest thing ever. Um, and they'd tell you, can you put this in a shape file? What the hell is a shape file? I was editing company stories and finance stories, and here they are asking, can you do a locator map of the Paris shootout? What the hell are you trying? I, I had no idea what I got myself into. But that was a challenge that I took head on. So I spent a lot of time at home reading blogs and following people on Twitter and responding to their tweets, um, looking at something that they did and trying to follow it and pretending that I did what I knew what I was doing. Um, and a few years later, this is what I have done. So back at the Financial Times, we produced um, graphics that were for the newspaper, for the web, and for video. So I did stuff like this. This was for, so these maps get embedded in our news stories. Um, this was about the Yangtze disaster in China. So 
for a reader that doesn't really necessarily know, you know where Yangtze River is or where China is or where this events happen, the maps give them another layer of familiarity to what is going on or which part of the world is experiencing this. So that's, I think, what's interesting about the merging or the collaboration between visuals, mapping, GIS with words is that it gives your reader another layer of, of familiarity and it's more of he can visualize or she can visualize like who are the people experiencing this or where this is happening in relation to where that person is. Because I'm pretty sure not everyone knows where North Korea is. Um, there was one story that went out that people in the US were asked, can you put in a map where North Korea was? It was insane. They put it all over the world. So I think this gives us um, the assurance that maps are needed in the stories, for journalists anyway. Um, um, so now I work for Bloomberg, and these are some of the maps that I do. Um, so we've been doing reports on the expanding um, Belt and Road project by China, and it seems like they've actually been all over the world. So this shows our readers that you know these are areas where um, these are the countries that signed the Belt and Road Agreements. And these are the potential areas that China wants to go to. And these, is the, these area is not included. So if I explain that in a paragraph or two or three, it would confuse my readers. But if I showed them you know, in one map saying, and color code it and say, OK, this is the information I want you to process. And that's a very strong um, way of explaining it without using so many words. So this is showing the railways in India. And we put little locator maps to show that, hey, this is where it is in the whole world. Because they might not be sure like, which part of the world it is. So it just gives them you know, a little snapshot of it. And we overlay data on the map as well to show. Um, so this is a company in China that has been expanding worldwide. So we want to show our readers, like, this is, these are the areas they focus on. These are the countries that they are present in. And we show the value in terms of circles. So they can show that the bigger the circle is, the bigger um, money they're bringing into that country. This is the same idea. And we showed um, in this map the routes that the China Air Force and Navy has been using in the South China Sea. Um, and we tracked their, the frequency of their movements and color-coded it to show that, you know, in 2016, this is what they used, and this is what, like, which branch used it. So aside from the maps that go into our stories, we build stories that are purely um, data-driven. So these are like standalone stories that have their own narrative and they are not like breaking news stories or feature stories. Um, and this is, these maps are part of it. I can't take all the credit for this map because I had a partner in Hong Kong who helped me with the final styling of it. So it's more of me doing QGIS stuff, um, plotting everything that we needed, adding bathmetry, all the reliefs and stuff. And um, we have to style the maps so that it would look well with all our other graphics. So we have three in this story, and I'm going to show you how it looks like on a page. So these are the, the areas that we focused on. And this story looks like this. So this is um, a graphic story that we produce. So we have charts that come with it. And then we have maps so that we don't have to explain everything in the copy. And then we introduce the readers to which part of the world this is. And we don't just make maps for the sake of it. We don't usually use bathymetry um, on our maps. But for this, we realize that it's quite important because we're trying to show ship routes. So adding how deep the water is in these areas 
would be another level of um, information that you're providing to your readers. So basically we use the map to provide context to our story. Um, yeah. So some stories have only maps, but a lot of our um, data-driven pieces come with both um, charts and maps. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day <coughs> basis. Um, another map that I'm quite pr proud of are the pollution maps that I've been creating. So um, now we've seen, well actually, we've been seeing China's um, pollution change through the years. It was quite bad at some point and now they're claiming that it's improving. And if they say that, it's tough for your reader, or even for the journalist, to visualize that. How can you say it's improving? Like, which parts of China or which parts of the world are actually suffering from, you know, really bad pollution? And I got this data from Berkeley Earth that allows you to exactly show that. Um, so the parts where you see the dark red are the really bad areas. <clears throat> and this data was taken during winter time. So this is when China burns a lot of coal to heat the homes. Um, but I did another map quite recently, and it looks like that. So there's, it's, it's tough to compare them just because I use different um, palettes, because they came in different stories, and that happens for us. But you'll show that there are green parts now, which says, you know, in the summer, it's quite good, just because they're burning less coal. And how does it look like in a story? So this is China's war on pollution will change the world. And it's opened by the map. So it's, it sets the context for, for our story. Like this is how bad it can get. And this is where it is in the world. And then it's followed by you know, the charts that we visualize. And usually we use like um, one color palette to tie it all together. So this is how I use QGIS in my job and how I feel it is important as a journalist for me to have that skill. Because not a lot, well, I'm not sure how many journalists have transitioned from being you know, a beat reporter and editor to someone who can actually visualize and do GIS. The learning curve was a bit steep just because I didn't know anything. But um, every time I feel like I've mastered it, like I can do this kind of map in five minutes, somebody tweets something that's something new, it's like, we added something. We've upgraded. We have, I feel like I could never keep up. But that's a good thing, right? Um, you know, I, I just downloaded the latest version and you know the latest plugin and then somebody comes out I did this relief and I'm like how dare you <laughs> but but I think that keeps it interesting for us and it keeps us learning like personally I see that as a challenge and it's a very good um, indicator that the community is growing and we are growing as um, cartographers and experts here or people who pretend to be cartographers <laughs> or, or, try, or try to become cartographers and make it, like add value to what we do on a daily basis. Um, for QGIS, I think one major problem, not really a major problem, but like a challenge that I've seen is that the bugs that keep on coming up. But I feel like we have um, a community that is very much willing to help you out so if people are not aware, there's uh, the spatial community on Slack where you can just post your questions and people respond to you very quickly. It's your very own support group, um, which is amazing. And I think another, there are a lot of um, online trainings, but personally it would be great if universities, maybe universities here are doing that, but from where I'm from, we, don't, we didn't really learn QGIS in university. We're, we're not given that chance. So if there were just more trainings, I feel, that are provided for free in communities or groups that are interested, then that would be um, incredible for people who are willing to learn, 
but have no idea what they're getting themselves into. And that's it for me.